Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for our Germination Strategy Session webinar. We've got a really good one planned for you today, and I'm sure that you're going to have lots of questions. You will notice on the left-hand side of your screen there is a chat box. You can pose your questions at any time. We do have question periods program or set aside, and uh, I'll be reading the questions out to our speakers, and they'll be able to answer you during the appropriate question session. So my name is Patty Townsend, and I am your host for this germination webinar. And I'm really excited to get this thing going, so we're going to get the, the ball on the road here. Um, first of all, I wanted to just say thank you very much to the sponsors of our strategy sessions and this particular webinar, Bayer Crop Science or Bayer FP Genetics, Syngenta, 2020 Seed Labs, and CCAN. So thank you very much for our sponsors. You make it possible for us to bring these informative sessions to the people who sign up for them. And we have a good turnout this time, so we're going to move on. This is the way that we're going to run this webinar. You'll see the agenda on the screen in front of you, the welcome and instructions. We are pretty much done. We're going to start off with the agronomics of managing fusarium head blight with Pam DeRocchini from the Manitoba Agriculture, Food, and Rural Development. We have a question and answer session after that that you can direct your questions to Pam. Once again, you use that chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Then we're going to move into using seed treatments and fungicides with, with Troy Basaraba from Bayer. And again, another question and answer session. If you uh, thought of a question that you wanted to ask Pam and you forgot in the first session, you'll be able to do it in the second. Then we'll have some closing remarks. So we have about 50 minutes for this webinar. And uh, so I'm going to move it along and introduce you to our very first speaker. Pam DeRocchini is the Provincial Cereal Crop Specialist with Manitoba Agriculture, Food and Rural Development. She's based out of the Crop Industry Branch in Carmen, Manitoba. Pam has a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Plant Science, both from the University of Manitoba. She joined Manitoba Agriculture in February 2001 and moved to her current role in December 2004. Pam and her husband Norbert, along with their two boys, own, operate a purebred Simmental operation near Haywood, Manitoba. So take it away, Pam. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak today. I think we've got a really interesting topic and hopefully we answer a lot of the questions that producers have in terms of managing fusarium head blight. So I will get underway since I believe I only have uh, 20 minutes to cover quite a bit of material. So um, let's get going. So really what is fusarium head blight? Um, really what it is, is it's a fungal disease of small grain crops and that of course can include wheat, barley, oats, uh, corn, triticale, um, rye as well. Um, in terms of the causal agent, the most often one that we hear about is fusarium uh, graminearum, um, but unfortunately there are other, other causal agents as well. Um, so we often hear fusarium comorum, uh, fusarium avenicium, so there's a few other ones that are out there as well. But this is the one that we often hear most about is the fusarium uh, graminearum. Um, in terms of the symptoms that we typically do see uh, with fusarium head blight, um, in terms of kind of moving from the photos from left to right, um, in terms of the symptoms that you often see in the field, um, you'll often see those bleached heads, and that's often the first telltale sign of an infection by fusarium head blight. Um, the infection can be either the entire head or as in the picture here, um, it can be sections um, of the spikelet, of the, of portions of the head in terms of just the number of spikelets that can be impacted. Um, if you look at the center photo, um, in terms of kind of when we look up closer uh, within the plant head, um, you can see uh, masses of either white or pink or orange spores, and those often form along the base of the glooms or over the infected head as well. And then if we look at the last picture, um, often what we'll see uh, once it's been harvested um, is shriveled, shrunken, or lightweight kernels. And we often refer to these as um, fusarium damaged kernels, or FDK. Um, as I mentioned before, um, a number of small grains can be impacted by fusarium head blight. And here's just a couple photos um, showing symptoms in six row barley and in oats as well. Um, in barley, um, the infected spikelets can also show that kind of bleached appearance, or there can also be a browning or wa a water soaked appearance as well. Um, and in oats, um, you don't often see symptoms. It's actually very rare to actually see 
um, infected spikelets um, or um, uh, infected uh, kernels within the field. Um, so it's actually very rare um, to see it actually out in the field. But it, it has been obviously by this picture uh, taken by um, a former scientist uh, with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, Dr. Andy Takeouts. But in terms of looking at the history of fusarium heblite um, within, within Canada, um, if you actually look at the Canadian Grains Commission site, they have actually some really good information in terms of, you know, the history of fusarium heblite in Canada. Um, if we look at eastern Canada, um, they have losses, they've noted losses from fusarium heblite in that eastern Canadian region um, date to at least the early 1940s. Um, in the prairies, um, fusarium heblite was first actually identified, I think it was in the night, around 1919. And then in Manitoba, it was actually identified in 1923. Um, there was actually no serious outbreaks until about the mid-1980s. And then what we did see was in 1993, actually our first very serious or severe outbreak of fusarium heblite. Um, this is actually corresponding as well to um, in the United States where actually they actually call it the great scab epidemic of 1993. So they have a little bit, I guess, more of a, a name for it um, in terms of that really first serious outbreak in 1993. And actually if you look at a little bit of history in terms of the Canadian Plant Disease Survey, um, they had definitely in that volume in terms of noting that Southern Manitoba definitely had the most severe epidemic of fusarium heblite on record to that date. And it, they were saying it, it was actually in part due to the high levels of precipitation um, that, th that occurred throughout the growing season. And if we even look at a little bit more um, in terms of the Grain Commission, they said about 7% of the Manitoba wheat graded, like in 1993, was graded sample on account of fusarium damaged kernels. And actually 36% of it was actually graded feed. So they were estimating that in 1993, you know, that cost of that epidemic from fusarium heblite was about $75 million. So it definitely can have a, a huge financial impact to producers and to the associated industries as well. So this is just a little figure from the Canadian Greens Commission just showing um, kind of the progression of um, uh, fusarium uh, across, I guess, Manitoba into, western, into the western prairies. And I apologize to those that are in eastern Manitoba listening in, but uh, we did source this from the Canadian Greens Commission. So if you move to our next slide, and I already kind of previously mentioned this um, already before in terms of the Canadian Plant Disease Survey. And I, I, I mentioned this because um, disease surveys are really an important um, component of integrated disease management plans. Um, you know, surveys can really give you an idea if there's any potential problems in terms of disease levels are high, you know, if there's any changes in pathogen types or races that are occurring. And, you know, it really does supply information that can be used, you know, in the future for, you know, monitoring and control measures and, of course, provide that historical information in terms of, you know, severity of disease in any given region or area. And, of course, uh, sometimes it also provides an assessment of those losses. So this is a really good source of information in terms of looking up, you know, historical impact, trends, those types of things um, for, for producers or even, uh, you know, agronomists for extension personnel to have a look at in terms of, um, you know, what we've seen in the past and, and uh, this is done every year. So we believe uh, the 2015 year, which will be marked by the 2016, volume 96, should be up shortly this week, hopefully. So something to keep in mind. So. For those producers that are listening on the webinar today and if somebody asks you to be part of, you know, an annual disease survey, you know, definitely consider saying yes. As, you know, the information gathered through these surveys are definitely, definitely invaluable. So if we move quickly in terms of just a quick overview in terms of the fusarium heblite disease cycle and I noticed it wasn't on this slide but this is a graphic um, from North Dakota State University from their Department of Plant Pathology. Just so just going through this quickly, of course, uh, fusarium heblite, the fungi overwinter on infected crop residue or on uh, seed as well. Um, if you move to the next, spores are then formed from the fruiting structures on the crop residue. And then those spores can then spread by rain or by wind. Um, and move to the next in terms of the flowering, uh, when the crop is flowering and if other conditions are met, and I'll go a little bit more into depth into our, in our next slide. But if those conditions are met, um, you know, infection can occur. And then, of course, if infection does happen, that's when we start to see the symptoms um, appear within the crop. 
So in terms of the overall um, fused area pet blight infection process, um, you know, the development of those spores on the infected residue um, is favored by those warm and moist, um, uh, warm and moist conditions. Um, you know, of course, um, once those spores are released, um, once again, like I said before, they're spread by that wind and the rain. But for spore germination and infection to, to occur, we need at least 12 hours of precipitation uh, or high humidity as well. Um, that's actually required for that to happen. Um, keep in mind as well that we don't only need precipitation, but we also need um, favorable temperatures as well. And that usually ranges in between 16 to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, for Fusarium gramenarium, um, that the optimal range is usually anywhere from that 25 to that 28 degrees Celsius. Um, then as we move on in terms of for infection to occur, the crop usually needs to be at that flowering or at that anthesis um, time period. So that's when the florets are open um, and that allows the spores to come in contact with that developing floret. Um, having said that though, um, the fungus can actually also enter through um, things such as wounds caused by like hail, birds or insects as well. Um, if infection does occur, usually um, symptoms start to appear within 14 to 21 days afterwards. Um, it has been noted that you can start to see symptoms maybe within three days, but normally it is within that 14 to 21 days um, after anthesis or after infection has occurred. Um, keeping in mind though that infection can still occur during seed set if warm and moist conditions um, still continue throughout that period. Of course, the biggest thing um, in terms of the impact of of fusarium hemp blight to producers' bottom line. Um, it comes down to a few things. Um, of course, there's that reduced yield. Um, you know, reduced yield is usually a, re a result of either the floret sterility that's caused, so th actually there is no kernel that's produced, so of course that's impacting your yield potential, or there's per seed fill, um, and those lightweight kernels either blow at the back of the combine, or they contribute to a poor sample, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so then, um, so that's direct impact in terms of that reduced yield so you're harvesting less product. Um, the other factor that we really need to consider as well is your reduced quality. So there's those fusarium damaged kernels that we've talked about before. Um, obviously that can impact the quality of the grain sample and then obviously impact um, our marketing opportunities through that downgrading of fusarium damaged kernels. Um, but there's also that unseen impact that we're going to talk a little bit more too about is um, a production of mycotoxins as well. Um, in terms of the most common one, um, we'll just refer to it as Dawn. Um, that's the most common one that we often hear about and it can have an impact on livestock in terms of when you're feeding it. Um, livestock, depending on what type we're talking about, can vary in their tolerance to Dawn, so testing obviously is important. Um, and say if you're looking at say something like for barley, um, you know, if you're looking at malting barley, it can have, a, you know, a negative impact in terms of the brewing malting process as well. So um, not only are we reducing yield, but we're also impacting the quality of the product as well. And one thing that's not on this slide either is, you know, there's other imp uh, impacts as well, so such as, say, increased management costs. So now we have things that we have to look at as from producers' perspective in terms of, you know, restricted crop rotations, um, increased cost of control measures. So these are all things that can definitely have an impact to um, the producer's bottom line. And like I mentioned before, um, there are those mycotoxin challenges. Um, there are no races within um, Fusarium graminarum, but there are different isolates that produce different toxin profiles. Um, within the Fusarium graminarum uh, population, there are two main chemotypes um, within Canada. There's the 15-Adon and there's also um, the 3-Adon. Uh, the 15 Adon was actually more common prior to the 1990s, um, but we're starting to see a shift towards that um, an increase in the 3 Adon uh, chemotype population. And really these shifts could be due to a number of things, um, either changes in pathogen populations, um, warming weather patterns, or even different farming practices. I think what's good to note here though is, um, is that the current resistance genes that are used in breeding programs and for fungicides applications as well, um, both of those do hold up to either of the chemotypes. Um, so there really isn't a change um, needed in terms of the current best management practices that we'll get into in a little bit. Um, 
one interesting thing though to keep in mind too is you know in terms of the Green, Canadian Greens Commission, uh, they have their grading tolerances. They account for um, dawn accumulation through the grading factor of fusarium damage kernels or FDK. Um, in the past, it's typically been that um, one-to-one ratio in terms of FDK to dawn, um, but there has been that variation over the years where um, the percent of FDK isn't accurately predicting what the dawn content is. Um, so, you know, they're always continually assessing what that what that ratio is. You know, if there's changes needing uh, changes needing to the grading tolerances, those may need to be made as we go further into the future. Um, as well, we're seeing a trend as well in terms of producers actually testing um, samples of, of their harvested grain um, for dawn content and using that as, you know, to assist with the marketing of their grain as well. So things to keep in mind. But in terms of getting really to the meat of it, you know, we're talking really about how do we best manage um, or mitigate the impact of fusarium heblate. And really what we need to do is really use an integrated pest management approach, and it's really critical for managing fusarium heblate. Um, you know, here in Manitoba and, of course, elsewhere across Canada as well, I think we've really consistently found that using only one strategy is not going to work. We need to use a combination of management strategies um, to make sure that we really are trying to mitigate that impact. Um, you know, unfortunately, what the bad news is, is that even if we do use all those tools in our toolbox um, in terms of all the best management practices that we're going to be talking about. Um, you know, if the weather conditions are perfect and the inoculum is present, um, you know, fusarium can still occur in spite of our best efforts. So um, often with anything within the farming, uh, within any growing season, Mother Nature often has the final say in terms of how severe anything can be. Uh, the same can be said for fusarium heblite, but that doesn't negate the fact that um, you still should be using all of these practices um, together to try to mitigate that impact if, um, of, of fusarium heblate for sure. Um, in terms of just a quick review, I can't, I cannot do um, a disease management talk without talking about the disease triangle, um, and everybody's probably seen that these millions of times, but we just need to remind ourselves that when we're talking about disease management uh, and the development of disease, you know, we need those three things. We need the pathogen, we need the susceptible host, and of course we need, you know, conducive environmental conditions as well. Um, so if we can manage, uh, you know, obviously we can manage two of these factors. I don't think we've been able to manage environment too well lately. But if we manage, you know, you know, the pathogen side of the triangle and the, and the host portion, um, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, manage the risk. So the first practice, what we'll talk about is crop rotation, and I've kind of thrown in field choice uh, or selection in here as well. Um, in terms of a rotation, we definitely recommend at least a break of one year, and actually, actually, would prefer two years um, is advised between cereal crop types. Uh, we want to really try to avoid a corn cereal rotation, um, and that's just because, as um, you know, there's species of fusarium, uh, fusarium that can cause fusarium heblate. Uh, that cause fusarium heblate can also um, impact corn production as well. Uh, so in corn, it causes stalk, uh, root, or ear rot, and of course, that resulting disease pressure can result in uh, disease surviving on that crop residue, and of course, providing another source of inoculum for future years. Um, so we definitely try, want to try to avoid that corn cereal rotation. Um, you know, a diversity really in the rotation kind of allows time for that crop residue um, to break down and the pathogens that survive on that crop residue to break down as well. And of course, hopefully that will reduce the risk to um, subsequent crops. Um, unfortunately, the other thing is, or another option as well to keep in mind is um, if you know that your neighbor had, a, you know, a significant fusarium head blight infection, in it last year, um, you may want to try to avoid planting your susceptible small grains, so it's just your wheat or your barley next to that field as well. So that's something to keep in mind going forward. Um, you know, having said all of that though, unfortunately spores um, are mobile. Uh, we talked about them being able to move with rain or with wind. Um, they can't move long distances, but they can move a little bit depending on how, how windy it is. Um, so of course, uh, your neighboring fields can be a source of inoculum as well. So even though you can manage uh, what's going on in your, your piece of land, um, you may not necessarily be able to manage what's going on around you. But having said that, though, crop rotation still really is a piece that you should be practicing in terms of trying to manage, um, you know, manage fusarium heblate. 
Uh, the second one we'll talk about is residue management. Um, so this is almost what we're talking about is tillage. You know, we've already gone over that, uh, you know, Fusarium can survive the winter on infected crop residue. And of course that provides the inoculum for the following year as well. Um, you know, you can uh, bury crop residue with tillage and that can also often help with uh, decomposition as well. Um, uh, there's been actually work that has been done looking, quite a bit of work actually, that's been done looking at tillage and Fusarium heblite. And a lot of those research um, in terms of the results have been actually quite variable. Um, Dr. Jeannie Gilbert, who was a Fusarium heblite specialist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada before she retired, um, she had summarized some studies and they have showed that in terms of tillage and Fusarium heblite development, um, that no-till had the lowest amount of actually Fusarium heblite development, followed by conventional till and then by minimum till, which is somewhat um, counterintuitive to what we've talked about in terms of trying to bury some of that residue to aid in decomposition. Um, but having said that though, um, even with tillage and regardless of what this, a lot of the studies are showing, um, even if the disease inoculum could be completely eliminated from a field, um, once again, we're talking about um, you know, mobile spores um, to a certain degree that could be blown in from neighboring fields. And um, you know, a question I've often got too before is, um, you know, crop residue burning, is that an option? Um, and really that really is really ineffective um, because it doesn't actually destroy obviously all the residue that's in a field. Um, and it doesn't actually destroy the roots or the crown tissue that's also there that can also be overwintering sites um, for the fungus as well. So once again, um, even if this isn't one of the strongest uh, tools, um, it's still something to keep in mind in terms of trying to manage um, Fusarium heblite. Probably the biggest one um, that I look at is definitely um, uh, choosing your variety selection. And I have crops in there as well because there are differences between crop types in terms of their susceptibility to, to Fusarium heblite. Um, if we look kind of going from most susceptible, we have our Canadian Western Amber Durham class, um, our Canadian Western Extra Strong, Triticale, Witcher Wheat. And then we go along the spectrum in terms of followed by CPS, our Canadian Prairie Spring, our Canadian Western Red Spring, um, followed by barley. And in terms of differences between six row and two row, we definitely have uh, six row being more susceptible, generally speaking, um, than two row. And then we have the least susceptible, which is oats. So that's kind of the continuum in terms of the crop types. Um, but then once again, um, you do see varying levels of resistance uh, between varieties within each of those uh, crop types as well. Um, and that's something that I think breeders have really done a great job in terms of doing, there's been some really great genetic advancements in terms of incorporating uh, resistance um, into, into many of the varieties that we've seen. And we actually do have two varieties that do have that resistance or are rating to Fusarium heblate. Um, we have Emerson, which is a winter wheat, um, and we also have AAC Tenacious VB, which is a CPS. So um, the ratings for um, resistance to Fusarium heblite can be found, and I apologize for just throwing up seed Manitoba, but I may be a little biased, but uh, the ratings can be found in any of the provincial seed guides that are out there. So um, if you know, in terms of choosing varieties, that information definitely is available in a lot of the seed guides that are produced uh, in each of the provinces. Um, and a lot of those ratings, or most of those ratings, are actually derived, um, especially in Western Canada, through the variety registration process. Um, Fusarium heblite has been recognized, you know, as a priority one disease where, you know, where data actually is required for support um, and subsequent registration of a variety. So this is, this is great because this means that there's information being gathered, um, being collected that shows us what um, the resistance uh, ratings are for a lot of the varieties that are coming up uh, through the registration system as well. Um, and just to kind of give you a look, quick peek in terms of um, you know, what we have seen in the past in terms of varieties with improved resistance. So this is um, in 2014, we had definitely here in Manitoba, Fusarium, impact, uh, Fusarium head blight impact our winter wheat crop. Uh, this is a variety trial in terms of post-registration variety trialing that we do here in Manitoba. Uh, this is a trial that was actually in, uh, near Carberry, Manitoba, and we actually have a variety that had improved resistance to Fusarium heblite, and then we had in the same trial a variety with minimal resistance to Fusarium heblite. So we can definitely see um, just in this shot alone the difference uh, that can be made in terms of selecting a variety with improved resistance to Fusarium heblite. 
Um, but of course, um, having said that, though, we really need to keep in mind that um, resistance or that R rating does not equal immunity. So this is just some of the registration data uh, that was provided when Emerson, which is the winter wheat with that R rating, um, was brought forward for registration. Um, it definitely does show that it has earned that R rating in terms of that resistance rating. But do notice that even though it has that R rating, there is still disease development um, that did occur. So um, it's definitely an improvement, definitely has earned that R rating. Um, but it will still see, you'll still see um, infection occur, um, but although at really lower levels that we typically do see in a susceptible variety or something like that. So, um, so this is something that I keep reminding producers is that you know resistance definitely does not equal immunity. And the last part I'll talk about before I hand it over to my counterpart is to definitely um, know what you're planting. So t seed testing is really critical. Um, it's obviously the most accurate way to determine the ability of seed to germinate um, and as well to determine the presence of disease. Um, so as we know, Fusarium infected seed can cause per emergence, can cause seedling blight and result in reduced tillering as well. But just keep in mind that, um, you know, if you've had your sample graded, um, that doesn't necessarily indicate the quality of your grain sample for seed. And just because there's an absence of fusarium head blight symptoms um, on the seed, um, that doesn't mean that it's actually fusarium free seed. So this is why testing your seed is absolutely critical. Um, and this is just keeping in mind too that you know planting infected seed can not only impact the stand establishment for that year, um, but it can also be a future source of inoculum for infection in in subsequent years. So this is really important to keep in mind. And of course, depending on where you're from or where you're listening in um, in this webinar. Um, there can be different recommendations depending on where you are. So definitely if you're, if you're listening in from Alberta, um, obviously one of their action items is, you know, you must avoid planting seed um, infected with uh, Fusarium graminearum. Um, so you definitely need to be testing your seed. Um, in Saskatchewan, they have different thresholds in terms of when you should be using seed or when you should be throwing away seed. Um, so whatever region you're from, uh, definitely check in with your local extension person or your agronomist um, to see what, uh, what the recommendations are in terms of using uh, fusarium infected seed is. Um, obviously, seed treatments can protect germinating seed and young seedlings from either seed-borne or soil-borne pathogens. So that's definitely an option that is available. Um, but keep in mind that seed treatments do not cure pure seed lots. Um, and it actually won't prevent Fusarium head blight from developing later in the season from stubble borne inoculum. So those are two things to keep in mind. Um, the other thing too is in terms of seeding rates, um, if there is a little bit higher disease pressure present on the seed, um, producers could increase their seeding rate to try to compensate for that. Um, the added benefit of maybe increasing your seeding rate as well is it actually might decrease the amount of tillering that you see and actually might provide a more uniform flowering time and now that's relating into fungicide application in terms of trying to time that. Um, so if you have a more uniform flowering time, um, maybe that'll make your ap uh, fungicide application timing a little bit easier as well. And of course, whenever I talk about seeding rates, um, you as producers definitely need to be looking at determining it using a target plant stand, using your thousand kernel weight, um, using your percent germination, and of course using your expected seed survival or a, per a percentage of your seed mortality. So you may need to bump that up a little bit in terms of if you are using seed that um, uh, does have um, disease present uh, that could impact your stand establishment. Um, but that's all that I have at this point. Um, if there's any questions or if you just wanted to, I'll let Patty, you can steer me in the right direction here. I will do that. Thank you very much, Pam. That was very informative. We do have a few questions. At the very beginning of the presentation, you talked about the different strains or um, species of fusarium other than graminearum. And, I, and one of the questions we have is, do you know what the effects those other species may be having on yield and dawn levels? It really will depend on um, the causal agent. And when I when I talked about the um, the annual disease surveys that take place, you there actually is 
an analysis in terms of what are the causal agents or the different fusarian species that are causing the infection that we are seeing out in the fields in terms of the surveys that are taking place. Um, we often more refer to, like I talked about before, the fusarium graminearum, just because that's the more prevalent one. There are others out there, um, but in terms of their impact, they're probably having similar impacts, but I know different species can, can produce different toxins as well. Um, but that's probably a little bit deeper than we need to go to today. So um, the, I think my contact information was up there, so they can definitely contact me directly for, for a little bit more of that information. Perfect. So I have a, I'm going to group the next couple of questions, and uh, they, they're talking about resistant cereal varieties. If it's, it, and I think you answered this one, but when a cereal variety has an R rating, is it fully resistant? No, and I think um, one of those slides definitely um, did show it in terms of, um, you know, resistance definitely does not like equal immunity. So that's something that when we finally did have varieties that were coming forward um, that did have that resistant or that R rating, we really did take, um, I guess, a informing producers that even though it had that R rating, it doesn't mean that you're not going to see symptoms develop or that infection can't, you know, occur, that resistance does not equal immunity, that, you know, even under um, conditions where there's high inoculum levels and conditions were just perfect, you know, at time of flowering for infection to occur, that you can still see symptoms appear. So, um, it definitely will be better than if you had, say, a susceptible variety, um, but you, you can see you can still see symptoms appear with a resistant variety. Okay, so then another question that follows from that is, given where you're from, it's understandable that a lot of what you were talking about was Western Canada, but Ontario and Quebec also have a very substantial concerns about fusarium head blight. And one of the questions that I actually had was, when we looked at those R ratings and the minimal resistance ratings, do those carry through across Canada? Are they the same ratings and are they used in the same way in Alberta, say, as they are in, in Quebec or in Atlantic Canada? So I'm going to show my, my bias again, maybe, but when we talk about the ratings that, say, appear in the three provincial sea guides in Western Canada, so... Um, you know, Sea Manitoba or Saskeed um, or the Alberta Sea Guide. The resistance ratings that are found um, for spring wheat um, or winter wheat come from the same, I guess, source of information in terms of the variety registration uh, process. So when a variety is brought forward um, for support for registration, Fusarium head blight has been identified as one of those diseases that data is required. And there's actually protocols that are established in terms of how much data is needed, how the data should be collected, um, how the data should be presented, um, so that between uh, the three provinces, um, in terms of being registered, that data set is, is I guess, the same. Um, so that's why if you look at the three provincial sea guides in Western Canada, the ratings are actually the same for each variety in each of the provincial sea guides because the data source is the same. Um, I believe there's a similar process um, as you move into Ontario. Um, I believe it's a similar process, whether or not it's exactly the same or not, I can't say for sure, but um, I could do a whole presentation in terms of how, you know, how the data is generated um, in terms of how those resistance ratings come about that you see for the varieties in seed Manitoba. But it, it's done through inoculated nurseries, um, at, which is really a, a critical piece, I think, in terms of really getting that differentiation um, between, you know, check varieties and the varieties that are being tested in terms of trying to accurately predict um, or accurately assign a rating um, for Fusarium head blight. So the next question along that vein, and, and we've got a couple, so we're going to have to move it along, is where can I source resistant cereal varieties? Uh, once again, um, in terms of uh, looking at your provincial seed guides, um, you obviously see the resistance ratings for the varieties that are being, you know, tested by each of the provincial, uh, by each of the provinces. Um, each of the guides will actually probably also provide a list as to who the distributor is for those varieties, and each of the, and as well provide, you know, a growers list in terms of who has registered seed, who has certified seed, you know, who has pedigreed seed production for sale um, available. So once again, those provincial seed guides are 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 a good source of information for that. 
another question sort of along that line is how when you've got varieties that are existing on the marketplace older varieties how are they compared to the new ones as they come into the market for determining those ratings so if you look at um, obviously a list of varieties within the, the provincial seed guides, uh, a lot of the older varieties that are in there, I don't know if you, you can't make per se a direct comparison between an older variety and a newer variety because they may never have been tested in the same time frame. Um, so obviously the data that's generated for each of them are over different time frames. Um, but having said that though, they are they do include in those inoculated nurseries um, what they call like disease checks. So they have they try to get that spectrum in terms of something that's really susceptible and then they have something that's resistant and then they have kind of uh, varieties within within between. They inoculate the nurseries to try to get the, that disease development so that when they're I guess, out in the field doing the ratings in terms of user and light index ratings that they do, the visual ratings, that there's that differentiation so that they can place in terms of how is that variety looking compared to the check versus the susceptible check versus, say, the resistant check. As well, over the last few years, they've actually started to incorporate uh, DAWN um, values as well into assessing what that rating would be for any given variety. Some of the older varieties that are listed in the guide, they may not have um, incorporated that DAWN uh, testing um, in terms of having that reading assigned to it, whereas a lot of the newer ones that are listed um, not only take into account the visual ratings, but also the DAWN accumulation as well. So um, much like anything, as things progress, as new testing, you know, testing becomes available, those types of things. Um, I don't think we'll ever have a continuum where everything is apples to apples, but I think what's important to note is that we do, you know, evaluate um, a lot of the varieties as they go forward. Uh, we continue to test them in different nurseries in coordination with, say, here in Manitoba, with the University of Manitoba, or with Agriculture and Agri-Food, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, to make sure that we are providing the most up-to-date information for producers in terms of the ratings that appear within the seed guide. So, you know, like I said before, they may not have been tested head-to-head -head over the same time period, but we are trying to make sure that we are doing some post-registration evaluations so that we are trying to provide the most up-to-date information for producers. Great. Thank you very much, Pam. We do have a couple of other questions. They're a little bit more general in nature, so I think with your permission, we're going to leave them to the end. We are running a bit short on time, and I'd like to move on to the next speaker. So our next speaker is Troy Basaraba. He's a senior market development specialist with, with Bayer. He's raised on a family farm in Gilbert Plains, Manitoba. He attended the University of Manitoba and graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce in 1995. Troy joined Proven Seed Division of United Grain Growers later that year and eventually moved to become the Brandon Technical Marketing Rep. In the spring of 2003, Troy joined Bayer Crop Science, working out of Brandon, Manitoba as a territory sales manager, and in 2008, he became the senior market development specialist with Bayer. He's still based in Brandon with his wife, Shannon, and his two boys, Taryn and Brody. So the uh, podium is now yours, Troy. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you guys are. So uh, again, uh, like Pam said, thanks for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you guys talking about, uh, I guess, my side of the equation, which looks at the world of seed treatments and fungicides with regards to trying to protect against uh, fusarium head blight. So this is a subject, actually, that I spent a lot of time on over the last number of years, and I could probably spend the next two to three hours talking to you guys about all the ins and outs and all that sort of stuff, but I'll, I'll try and boil it down into some of the high points here over the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, so we'll start with seed treatments and, and talk about um, some of those details there and then we'll switch over into foliar fungicides and and then kind of wrap it up with some of the agronomy into things in terms of you know when to spray how to spray uh, all that sort of stuff as well too so let, let's start off with seed treatments and uh, a, the role of a seed treatment is basically is to try and protect that seed that you drop into the ground and protect it against the seed and soil borne disease pressures that are out there so that that seed has the ability to germinate and get out of the ground quick and, and send the shoot up and, and start going after sunlight and basically start the whole growth process. 
So when you start looking at disease pressures out in the prairies, obviously there's, there's disease levels that are, that are concentrated on, on the surface of the seed. Uh, there's also pathogens that are in your soil as, as well too. So that, the whole role of the seed treatment is when you drop it onto the seed is to provide that, that barrier um, against the, the pathogens that are out there and to allow that seed the best opportunity to, to get its life started and to get out and, and to start producing yield. So there's nothing that we can do really with regards to the, the soil-borne pathogens out there in terms of trying to assess, you know, do you have it, what levels do you have it, and stuff like that. But as Pam mentioned before in, in her presentation, you know, we do have the ability to start looking at our seed source and look at, you know, how much seed is, is, a, is, is present on that seed. And, and this is where the role of seed treatments come in is with regards to trying to manage that disease presence that's, that's on that seed. Uh, last year, for example, we, we undertook a program in conjunction with BioVision uh, Seed Labs and where we, where we submitted samples, um, a, bare, a bare wheat and barley sample, and then we also treated uh, the same sample as well too with seed treatment and looked at it from you know, a disease control or disease suppression standpoint and also from a germination standpoint. And here's some of the results that we've seen just out of the program here this last year. Now, as the, the green bars that you see in front of there is basically the percent of seed infected with the various different uh, species um, across the bottom there. So the green bars are, are bare seed with no seed treatment. And then the blue bars that you can see is the percent seed infected um, where seed had been treated with seed treatment. And obviously you can see pretty much right across the board, and especially in the case of the fusarium bars uh, on the left, uh, seed treatments are actually doing a very effective job in terms of just simply reducing the amount of, uh, of seedling disease that's, that's present in our seed samples out there. So if you do have a sample that's, that's high in, 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 in seed-borne presence, uh, seed treatments are an effective way to kind of arrest uh, that development of it before it can infect the seed. The other thing we look at is just the germination of the samples as well too. And so when we went back to this study that we did, we, we grouped our and when we started to look solely at Fusarium graminarium, we, we started to group the samples into, you know, low levels and then higher and higher levels and stuff like that. So the bars on the left are where the bare seed samples had 0 to 5% seed infected with uh, Fusarium graminarium. The middle bars were where the untreated had uh, 5 to 10%, and then the bars on the right is where we had the highest. And what we're looking at here is the percent germination of these samples looking from an untreated to a treated scenario. And, and as you can see, that's, you know, as, as we would expect, the, the more disease presence that you have in your bare treated sample, the more it's having an impact on your germination of your sample. So as your, as your seed treatment controls your, your seedling borne disease, uh, it's, it's also enhancing your, your germination of, of your seed sample as well too and, and protecting the, those germination levels. The other thing we look at as well too is just you can see in the little whisker bars there on, on each of the bars um, is also narrowing up the range of, um, of germination levels uh, and trying to get it more and more consistent in terms of uh, being more of, a, more of a reliable predictor and more consistency in terms of the, the level of, of performance that you would see. But one of the big things that, in order to make seed treatment work, it basically comes down to three rules, and that is application and application and then application again. And I've said it time and time before, it's just that you can have the best seed treatment in the world, but if, you were, if we are not doing a good job of applying it onto the seed, then you pretty much lost the effectiveness of that seed treatment uh, and the, the maximum benefit that you can get out of it in terms of you know, seed and soil borne uh, disease reduction. And I'll, I'll illustrate it by this. This was some work that was done years ago uh, in our camp, and you can see the, the untreated sample that was plated out uh, in a lab here that was uh, very heavily infected. You can see that just the Petri dish was just completely infected. And over on the top right is where we have a really good, consistent seed treatment coating, and you can obviously see the level of disease suppression that's there. The, the three samples on the bottom were, was actually where we did a level of treatment, but we tended to have a very inconsistent level of treatment. You know, we had over on the left, like some really, really dark colored seeds, really that had almost an overload of seed treatment. Uh, and even to the ones on the right where we had a very light color and maybe not enough seed treatment uh, getting into this, into the seed treatment to do an effective job to mitigate uh, the seedling disease. 
And another set of photos here, uh, courtesy of Jennifer Deeks from Viterra here a few years ago. You know, good coverage across the seed is going to is going to make or break a seed treatment. And there, there's two aspects to that. One is just the process of getting it onto the seed uh, in terms of some form of application, or whether that's you know a dripper or a G3 or sprayed on. There's lots of different ways that you can you know physically apply it to the seed. But then one of the other things that really comes into play is the secondary mixing that's involved with it as well too, and that's basically you know, putting it through an auger or through some sort of uh, chamber system where you're getting these seeds to tumble around, to roll around, where you really get some good mixing action. Uh, and that's what you want is, is kind of like those, those two kernels that are over on the right, where you get a very consistent coat across the seed treatment. It's going to give you that nice kind of barrier all around the seed. Uh, and what we want to try and avoid is, is, you know, putting seed treatment on like those two seeds in the middle there, where you get a real kind of blotchy, inconsistent coat. Some seeds have more than, than others, uh, and maybe you're not getting kind of the true benefit of the seed treatment. You're still getting some benefit, uh, but maybe not the, the true benefit or the, the maximum opportunity uh, for kind of the best protection possible. So, you know, making sure that we've, we've seen a shift away from kind of the old-fashioned dripper style where you basically just stick the hose into the auger and it kind of drips on, and, and we've seen that that, doesn't do as good a job in terms of uh, applying seed treatment. We're seeing a lot of um, newer forms out into the marketplace now, like the G3s and the G40s and USCs and storm treaters that A, do a better job of your primary application in terms of like a spray coat on and then lots of secondary mixing to really get that consistent level of, of seed treating across. And that's where when you get that good secondary mixing and, and, and stuff, that's where you're going to get really good coverage and then your best uh, performance out of your seed treatment. And one thing that we absolutely want you guys to avo avoid is, is treating up dirty seed lots. Uh, and by dirty seed lots, I mean, you know, lots of dust in the sample, lots of chaff that's in there, you know, other kind of foreign bodies and stuff like that. Um, a lot of the dust and chaff and stuff like that, you know, these seed treatments, a lot of them are water-based now, so this chaff and dust will very much attract all of the moisture that's in there. And as you can see in the left picture there, basically all the chaff and stuff is, is sucking up all the seed treatment and not leaving much to go on to the actual barley seed. And when you see a lot of that chaff and, and dust picking up all that seed treatment, you start to see you know, clumping and build up uh, into your treaters like the pictures on the right. You can see, you know, actual physical clumps that interfere with seed flow uh, or just overall flowability of the green in general. You can see build up on augers and stuff like that. We, we get calls very consistently year over year with regards to, you know, seed treatments doing this. And a lot of the times it comes back to having a, you know, a, 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 not, a non clean sample where it's, it's, you're getting some of that clumping and stuff. So making sure absolutely that, you know, as we're getting set to put seed treatment on, making sure that our seed sources are, are nice and clean and, uh, and available for optimum uh, treatment. Switching gears to foliar fungicides um, on to, you know, later part of the equation and, you know, you've got the crop in the ground, it's coming out of the ground now, and as we're starting to get, it, to get into that susceptible fusarium period as the, as the heads start to poke out, this is when we start to look at foliar fungicides. Now, currently right now, there are 10 products in Canada uh, that are on the market with label claims of activity on, on Fusarium head blight. And they predominantly come from uh, the Trizol group of chemistry or, or fungicide group three. Um, but the key thing to note here is that none of these products that have claims of Fusarium head blight uh, on their label lists it as full-blown control. All the current label claims that are out there right now are for suppression only. So especially, it's, it's key to note that because in terms of how, how this disease gets manifested into the crop and then our ability to go after it with a fungicide, it's, it's a pretty complex equation. And right now, it's in terms of the best performance we're seeing, it is, is still falls into that suppression category. And if, for those of you that are familiar with the herbicide market, you know, when we look at per, you know, control versus suppression on a label, there's, there's obviously a level of difference there. And this is one thing to understand that foliar fungicides um, are, although they can be very, very effective, they're still not the bulletproof solution um, to 
uh, suppression of fusarium uh, head blight. Uh, even though there are 10 products out in the marketplace right now, basically the market has, and if we look at some of the current market research that we have out there right now, there are basically three products in terms of uh, Prezero, Folicure, and Corumba that pretty much encompass about 98% of the fungicide use uh, for going after fusarium head blight. Now there's another class of, of fungicide chemistry out there as well too. Those are the, the strobilarins or the group 11 um, group of fungicides as well too. And I just want to touch on them real briefly. Um, strobilarin chemistry is, is, is very, very effective in terms of controlling cereal leaf diseases. So this is like, you know, your tan spots, your septorias, your rusts. Uh, they're extremely effective and extremely efficacious uh, on, on the leaf spotting diseases. But one of the things that there is starting to be more and more of a growing body of evidence is that when we spray those strobilarian chemistries at heading time, uh, we have seen that these fungicides have the potential to increase the vomitoxin in the harvested grain. So not necessarily the, the fusarium damaged kernels like Pam talked about, but it's the, the vomitoxin and, um, that ends up on the seed at the end of the day. So it's not going to happen all the time. Uh, there's still a lot of work that's going on in this, in this field here right now to try and understand, you know, why strobilarian chemistry is, is sometimes causing this relationship. Uh, however, we have seen it, you know, here in Western Canada, both, you know, in both private and public testing, uh, we, and a large body of evidence south of the border coming out of like NDSU and University of Minnesota and stuff like that as well. So just kind of a heads up. Um, on this and, you know, as a kind of a general rule that I've always followed is that, you know, if you're looking at leaf disease control in, in cereals, you know, strobilarin is very effective through that flag leaf staging, but basically as soon as that head starts to, pock out, or to poke out of, the, out of the boot, then we should start switching back into the trizole chemistries and getting that fusarium suppression uh, as well too. In terms of the, the fungicide products that are out there, um, I mentioned the big three, Folicure, Prezero, and Corumba. Um, they do vary in performance um, across the prairies. This is uh, what's on the screen here right now. It's just some internal work that we've done within Bayer here over the last six years in terms of looking at these, trial, or looking at these products together and seeing how they perform. Um, and it, it almost comes down to a very much, uh, you will see varying levels of performance in terms of, you know, fusarium suppression, FDK and dawn reduction, and then corresponding yield protection with it as well too. Uh, and it's important to understand that these products, you know, they do react differently on that. And especially when we start looking at price of these fungicides and programming and all that sort of stuff, it, it almost starts to look into, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, in terms of, you know, the more dollars you spend, the better protection you get. Um, but there's a big, bigger equation with regards to the whole ROI in terms of, you know, yield protection, quality protection, price of the product, any programming that the companies offer uh, as well too. So to dive into a little bit more on this, I, I strongly encourage you to, you know, talk to, you know, your local salesperson or crop protection uh, retailer as well. And this is just, again, kind of looking back into that database here, looking at the FDK and, and dawn reduction that we've seen uh, in some of our trials here, again, dating back to 2009, where you can see, you know, uh, you know on, in the case of dawn reduction over on the right there, we can see upwards of a 50% reduction uh, in terms of vomitoxin. And like I said before, these products are still not bulletproof um, as of yet, and we do see some varying levels in terms of performance. So, again... Talk to your, to your local salespeople or, or try to find out some, some local results to get a better handle on in terms of what these will do in, in your local marketplace. So looking at the whole decision in terms of do I, do I not spray a fungicide? What's, what's all involved here? Um, you know, for I, I, I live in Manitoba and, and we've been living with foliar fungicides for fusarium suppression for as long as I've been in the market. Uh, but we see there's lots of areas in Western Canada that are just kind of now starting to really grapple with this reality. And so there's lots of questions with regards to, you know, should I, should I not, um, you know, what's the potential for it, all that sort of stuff. And, and this is kind of some of the, just a quick checklist to kind of for you guys to go look through. 
And Pam talked about the disease triangle in terms of, you know, obviously we need the pathogen, we need the host, uh, and we need the environment. So, we, you know, basis what we know in terms of the spread of fusarium across Western Canada, the pathogen is there. We know it is. And we know that we're going to be growing wheat and barley. So the big question every year seems to be, do we have the right environment that's going to give the opportunity for the fusarium to manifest itself and get, you know, get the spores going and infect the crop? So some things for yourself to kind of, you know, just a quick checklist is, you know, have we seen it? Have we seen fusarium pressure in the past? You know, what levels have we seen in the past? Have we seen complete train wrecks where we've seen massive infestations, or has it been kind of light to moderate levels? Um, have we had any past experience with fungicides uh, specifically going after this? You know, have we had guys that have tried any of the products I mentioned before? What was their success rate with them? Did they see much? Uh, did they see any difference at all? And then the other thing is for your, for you yourselves to make sure we're keeping abreast and, and monitoring and, and scouting. Now, like Pam mentioned, we're not going to be, by the time you see the symptoms of fusarium in your crop, it's, it's going to be too late to do anything about it from a foliar fungicide standpoint. But when I say scouting, this is one where we got to make sure we're keeping tabs of what's going on in that crop. So what is the disease presence that's in there? Are we seeing um, leaf spotting diseases like sepsoria, tan spot? You know, are we seeing, are they in the crop? What are they doing? Are they infecting badly? Are they at uh, light levels? What's the stage of the crop? You know, as we're progressing through, you know, the flag leaf stage and the head's coming out here in a little bit, you know, making sure we're keeping tabs in terms of how that crop is advancing. Uh, the environment for infection. Are we getting, you know, very heavy dews? Are we getting some rains? What's the temperature doing? Um, all those factors going back to what's going to give the best opportunity for fusarium to infect. And then the last thing is the quality of the crop and the yield potential. Obviously, it's a little bit easier to pull the trigger on fungicide if you've got a fantastic looking wheat crop ahead of you versus one that's, you know, maybe not as, not as good looking. And I can't emphasize this enough, and I've heard it time and time before, is that especially when regards to trying to evaluate the effectiveness of the fungicides and, you know, did they pay, did they not pay, you know, leaving a check strip is your only true way to figure out did it work? How well did it work? Was there a return on investment? Was it well worth the investment? And check strips can be, you know, they can be big areas like, you know, one, you know, 50 feet wide by the length of the field so you can actually do a full-blown yield measurement or even just a small area where you can actually go in and do just a visual, you know, look left to the untreated, look right to give yourself a, a visual evaluation of it. So I highly, highly recommend to make sure that we're leaving check strips to to ensure that we're understanding the full value of the return on investment of our fungicide. There are some tools out there um, as well too that growers can use. Um, Manitoba has been producing a, a fusarium headlight forecast map uh, for years now and there's some examples of the maps from 2014 here. I popped them up on the screen. Uh, Saskatchewan's doing the same thing as well too. I think Ontario is even running a version called Doncast. I'm not too familiar with that one though. But these maps are available and what they do is they look at weather patterns and rainfall events and relative humidity and basically come up with kind of here is your risk of or potential risk of infection given some of the environment uh, that we're seeing out there. And you can see obviously the ones, the, the three maps on the red, or three maps on the top, you know, obviously as they get into a red color that usually signifies a high potential for fusarium infection. Um, although the three maps on the bottom where you can see a lot more green color where it's maybe the potential for infection is not as high, it does not mean that we're still not going to get infected. For example, like the map in the bottom middle there was from July 13, 2014, and you can see it's, it's looking fairly safe. Um, however, I still sprayed trials at that day and still saw some massive downgrading due to uh, fusarium. What's the window? We always hear that guys want to spray the flag leaf to protect the flag leaf to protect the yield. And there's always that question, if I wait till the head time, you know, do I potentially pass that? And we say that even when you look at spraying fungicides at head time to protect against fusarium, for example, like in the, the set of plants there in the second, third from the right, you can still see that the flag leaves are still very much out and available for, uh, for coating with fungicide and potential for infection uh, as well too. So, 
it's, it, you know, from flag leaf through to the end of heading, we're kind of that 10 to 14 day window. So we still have the opportunity to protect flag leaves even when we're spring and heading time to get kind of a dual bang for our buck in terms of protection. We've always heard that um, spraying fungicides at heading time, it's a really, really tight window. I've heard three to four days before. So, you know, we've asked that question internally, like, is there a little bit more of a bigger window to apply? Like, you know, how early is too early? How late is too late? Uh, and you can see we did some trials here back in 2000, uh, back in 2009 and 10, I believe, looking at early versus optimal versus late timing. And you can see kind of the stages that we were targeting with these fungicide applications. Here's the results that we saw. Uh, we're basically that optimum timing where you know, right when that first flower is poking out of its head, uh, poking out of the head, that was still kind of where we saw the best response in terms of yield and quality protection. But we could see that, you know, both the early and late timing were also still providing very substantial protection in terms of uh, yield and quality as well, too. So that leads us into that, you know, our overall spray window is basically from when that head emerges to even to when we, our head is fully flowered and, and flowers are falling off. But optimum window is kind of when that head, you know, extends up from the flag leaf where we can get a good clear shot at it with the sprayer uh, to when the, those first flowers are, are poking out. That's where we would kind of see the, the ideal uh, window. But we do have a little bit more bigger window to, to play with in, term, in case the environment uh, runs a monkey wrench with us. Spraying fungicides on it though, and this is just kind of just to my last couple slides here. Going, trying to put fungicide onto a head is, is a really daunting task. And it's, you know, it's, it's a completely different mindset versus when you're spraying uh, herbicides, for example. You got to make sure that we're doing a really good job of coating that weed head from top to bottom, front to back, side to side, and getting a very consistent level of um, coverage right across that whole head. And any time that we do leave kind of blank spots on that head where we don't get that fungicide on, it's going to leave uh, an opportunity for fusarium to infect as well too. Um, just kind of hopping, just throwing the fungicide in the sprayer and bombing across the field is, is not enough. Um, this is some work that I did over the last couple of years looking at a couple of different nozzles and you know manipulating a few different uh, application variables in terms of trying to get better coverage on the head. And as you can see, you know the the those top pieces of water sensitive paper there is where we didn't do as good a job of applying uh, versus when we tweak some things, you know, up some water volumes and, you know, drop the boom down a little bit, get closer, we're doing a lot better job of, uh, of coating that head and, and getting a good barrier of protection. And one thing that's really shown, really stuck out to me is, is the height of the boom away from, from your weed head. And what we've seen is that as your boom gets further and further away from, from your weed heads, um, the ability to get a good coat of fungicide on there drops. And because what happens is when your spray pattern comes out, nozzle manufacturers will tell you that they want your, your nozzle to be 20 inches or less away from your target. And this is going to give you a good consistent level of coverage. But when we angle our spray patterns forward and backward, what happens is that once we start to get to the end of that 20 inch range, droplet starts to slow down, uh, gravity takes over, and then we start to see the droplets, they basically turn and fall vertically and fall right past the weed head, so we don't get a good level of, of coverage in this. And this is something that, you know, for anyone that's listened to Tom Wolf or, or Jason DeVoe talk, uh, this has been one of their key messages over the last while as well, too. Um, so in terms of applying fungicides, it's, it's not easy. It's very challenging, and just putting the newest, best nozzle into the sprayer is not necessarily, it can still be used incorrectly. It's not the, the be-all to end-all. We have seen time and time again that a forward-backward inclination is, is superior to just a single flat fan pointed uh, straight down. Uh, and the other thing is, is, you know, we always say minimum 10 gallons of water per acre, but the more water you can throw at it, the better. It's just going to make it easier to get better coverage. Uh, also targeting a medium to coarse droplet size, and that'll, you know, that's going to affect, you know, with your speed and the size of the nozzle you're doing, but we recommend basically that medium to coarse droplet size is going to give you the best opportunity for coverage and keep tight to that canopy. So nice and tight, 
Uh, the further you get away from the canopy, the, the less coverage you're going to get on that weed head. So it's tough, but let's make sure that we take our time and, and do a really good job on it. So just to wrap up, this is my last slides. Lots of different strategies, and, and even just going back to what Pam said, lots of different strategies to manage freezerium head blight. Uh, both from a cultural standpoint, you know, using varieties with stronger disease resistance packages, um, and then, you know, also incorporating the uses of seed treatments and fungicides to, you know, to help the, the process as well, too. And like I said before, using just one of them, and even Pam said this as well, too, using just one of these is, is not going to be as effective as using multiple different ways uh, to control fusarium head flight. Yeah, we can show some really good performance with fungicides, but if they're still over weak genetics and tight rotations, it's still going to be an uphill battle. So, uh, And then the last thing is if we are using seed treatments and fungicides, let's just make sure that, you know, whether it's going on the seed or going in the crop, that we're doing a, a really good job of applying these things and trying to make sure we get the best bang for the buck out of our, uh, out of our per crop protection products. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, Troy. I thought I found that very informative and, and very much appreciated. We had a whole bunch of questions, and actually you answered them as you were going through, so you did a really good job of anticipating some of the questions that were going to be asked. There is, There are a couple of general ones that I left from the beginning that if you guys, either one of you could answer fairly quickly, that would be appreciated. We are running a bit over time. And one of them is, what is the anticipated impact of fusarium head blight this year? given what we're seeing in terms of projections for weather and the outlook for this growing season. Can anybody answer that one? Uh, I'll take a stab at it. What's the anticipated, <laughs> what's the anticipated impact? Yep. I would say um, the, the anticipated impact, if you can tell me what the weather's going to be doing the last week of July, or last week of June, the first week of July, then we might have a better potential or better ability to to figure out what the impact's going to be. Um, we like we've got the host, we've got the pathogen. It's just what's that environment doing at the end of July? And I'm I'm not a weather forecaster for sure. Um, but if if all of a sudden if you know if if we're hot and dry in in June and July right through that kind of head flowering period, then obviously the potential for impact is going to be a lot less versus. You know, if we're getting, you know, mid to high 20s temperatures and nightly dews and getting the odd shot of rain, a lot of it will come down to what the environment is going to be doing on that. And kind of also just a second point would be what are growers planting this year? Are they moving into kind of stronger genetics and, you know, kind of giving a buffer zone right there in terms of just genetics resistance? Or are we still sticking with, you know, some stuff that have weaker genetic packages as well too? And unfortunately, I don't have a good handle on that. So kind of a wishy-washy answer, Pam, do you have you know what? To you know, the only thing I would add is I think that's why we always promote, you know, using multiple practices. So using resistance, using planning for a fungicide, you know, looking at crop rotation, all the things that we talked about in the last hour because the wild card is, is the environment. And depending on the environment, it often dictates how severe – infection can be and how what impact it will have so I think that's why we always encourage an integrated management approach for managing fusarium head blight um, because mother nature like I said before often has that final say in terms of how severe you know the impact of fusarium head blight will be in any given year so thank you very much to both of you I'm sure everyone on this call and, and on the webinar appreciated as much as I did and I think we learned a lot uh, once again, thank you to our sponsors, Bayer, FP Genetics, Syngenta, 2020 Seed Labs, and CCAN. And I just wanted to remind everyone that um, Germination does regular strategy sessions on topics of interest. The next two that are coming up will be in July and in September. In July, we're going to be talking about the uh, seed treatment protocols and treated seed guidelines, the crop life protocols, and the CSTA, CSGA treated seed guidelines. And in September, we're going to be talking about seed applied biologicals and micronutrients. So mark your calendars and, and join us then. And uh, once again, thank you very much for participating. This webinar will be available very soon at www.germination.ca. We strive for within 48 hours, sometimes even a little earlier than that. 
So if anyone did not get their questions answered and they want to have their questions answered, you may send them to me at ptownsend at germination or at issuesinc.com. That's ptownsend at issuesinc.com, and we will try to get them answered for you. Otherwise, thank you again for your patience. We went a bit over time. I appreciate very much you participating, and uh, look for us again in a couple of months.